we're going to get started with a little music. Uh, if I get the uh, correct, uh, we're going we're going to do it a little different tonight. For for get, get back to the old ways. Before. We're going to do a song and let uh, JJ. By the way, happy birthday to JJ. Happy birthday. Y'all all tell him happy birthday. Um, and then we'll do a song, let him talk, come back, do a few songs. And if I remember right, then we're going to let JJ, we'll do the message and we'll do a final song. I you think I have, do I have that order right? You, you may. Oh, well, I'm not. <laughs> hey, Terry texted us. Huh? Terry the production Terry. manager took care of it. Yes. <laughs> or one of them. All right. I wonder so ain't this life is on the sand I would let my dear Savior in finale roping Saturday, yeah. 9 o'clock it's going to start, uh, it's going to be a little warm, but that doesn't stop us crazy ropers, we'll still be there, so if y'all want to come by and stop and see and, and uh, you know, hang out, just come on, it, it's going to be a good time, uh, it's, we're giving away Henry rifles to the series winners and buckles and got some other door prizes and stuff and all for the ropers and all, so it's going to be really good. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, Father we thank you and we praise you, you're an awful, awesome mighty God. Father, we recognize you as who you are and what you are. You're a loving, caring Father, but you are also almighty God, worthy of all praise. You're the creator of all things, and it's in you who we put our trust. Father, we have gathered here tonight in this building and some uh, in their living rooms, Father, to listen to you and be taught by you and to hear from you to sing praises along with these guys behind me, Lord, that we can just lift up our voices that they might be as a sweet incense unto you. But more than anything, Father, we want to thank you for the love and grace that you show us each and every day, for the mercies that you pour out upon us. Father, I pray that this day we can say that we were pleasing unto you, that you were happy to be able to call us your sons and daughters. For, Father, that's why we have gathered here tonight, 
to worship you, to give you the honor and praise and all the glory. And we do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Say a prayer for Terry. She's traveling. She's flying out today. She's flying back tomorrow with our granddaughter, uh, one of our granddaughters that we haven't gotten to spend a whole lot of time with in, in her life. So we're pretty excited. Uh, Terry asked me uh, what I wanted for my birthday. And I told her, I said, just being able to have Allison here for a few days is, is a present enough. But she's got to deal with the airports and rental car places and all that stuff. She's flying, flew out today. She'll be flying back tomorrow. So she'll be pretty tired. So just give her a prayer. Amen. That's that traveling like that is is really really, um, especially during these times, it's really kind of trying a lot more so uh, than, it, than it has been in the past. Um, you know, JJ is talking about God and what God is for us and how good God is to all of us, and and um, that's something we always need to remember. Whatever's going on, He's been a good God. God has always been a good God. He's always stood up for His promises. It kind of brings to mind this little song. Um, so we'll see if we can pull this one off. Oh, this Christian life hadn't always been easy. The days when I asked the Lord why. I've seen the heartache and pain of some love. But it seemed all I could do was cry. Through all their storms, even through all their excited when someone comes to, to Jesus and comes to know uh, Jesus and starts to kind of learn and um, you know we're, we're, we, we talk about well they were in church again they were in church again they were in church again and, and that is a great thing um, but we need to always remember to, to, to pray for that person whether they're in church or not and that each person, each person that walks through the door um, struggles with something. Um, and to pray for those people. It kind of brings this song to my mind. Let's see if I get this one. Oh, Billy was a fine drinking man. The devil never had a better friend. 
Mary Johnson was an angel, bless her heart. We all cried the day she fell for this far. Oh, she found a man no one knew was there. All it took was two wings and a prayer. Mary Johnson is a saint, heaven. Sundays in a row he's been in church Oh, a little hard to recognize In his boots and starts white shirt There's a battle raging in his troubled soul I've won seven Sundays in a row Sometimes we all stumble and The little Billy sparks inside us all. But as long as we believe, there's always hope. More than seven Sundays in a row. Seven Sundays in a row, we've been in church. A little hard to recognize, and it's good to start to fracture. It's that eighth Sunday, um, the ninth Sunday. I, I read a, a thing today on uh, Facebook. Um, oh, maybe I guess I wasn't supposed to say it because I forgot what it was. Oh, um, yeah, I know it had to do with missing church. Um, missing church uh, is the hardest thing to do um, until you don't. Something to that effect. I'm not going to say, you don't remember the rest of it. Yeah, uh, but it was really a, a thing that made me think, because it talked about that first Sunday you miss is the hardest one. The second one, the third one, by the time the fourth one gets away, you don't miss church no more. Uh, so it's an important thing in everybody's life, I do believe. Um, and especially kind of in this world today right now, uh, they're trying to run... Uh, People, people are coming closer to God, but there's countries and within our own country that they're kind of driving away. And it kind of makes me think of this song. There's a lighthouse in the hillside that overlooks my sea key. When I'm tossed, it puts out a light. It's a light that I might the light that shines around me now will safely lead me home if it wasn't
but um, I don't believe it's going to be, I believe it's going to be a lot toastier um, than hell where there's no water. Um, so that was something that I try to keep in mind when I get thirsty. And I'm going to tell you what, there are a lot of the times there is nothing that tastes better than a good, cool drink of water. Um, just can't be beat. I can't go without um, doing a song about uh, the Lord, Lord taking your hand and holding my hand and how important it is for us to always reach out to God and, and keep our hand out because I can guarantee you He's got His hand out waiting for us. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on.
my heart I'll have no fear Cause I'm a better man Cause there's a man in here Amen Amen Thank y'all for the opportunity And let's let the birthday boy come up and chat with us That's you That's the first time you're doing really good. <laughs> no, there's been many of these. It is. Thank go. you, guys. It's wonderful, wonderful music. Uh, I tell you, it does our hearts good. It's, it's, it's like water for our souls. You know, we talk about drinking of water and being able to sing praises to God is like water for our soul. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if I said the word affair, everyone assume, if I said he had an affair, everyone assume that the guy had cheated on his girlfriend or his wife. Is that correct? Yeah. Sure thing. If I said he had a love affair, most people would assume that these pe these two were deeply in love, right? That they had an affair, but it didn't last long. From how we're under this impression that an affair is a brief moment. If they had a love affair, uh, or if a guy had an affair, it was a brief thing. And it almost comes to the conclusion that it's done, right? When we say he had an affair, it was in, it was in, and it was over. But then, you know, there's some positive sides to a love affair. Uh, you can say that Terry and I have a love affair with roping, right? America has a love affair with baseball. Uh, it's, you know, so Webster defines this love affair as a, ro ro a romantic attachment or episode between lovers. Another definition added, <clears throat> and who are not married. I, I don't know why that comes in, but we all just assume that it's not in there. And it says, <clears throat> a lively enthusiasm. Another definition says, an intense or eager interest in something. A strong liking or of a particular activity or a place. If you've referred to someone's love affair with something, you might mean that they're just very enthusiastic about it. They're just overly drawn about it. How many of you ever known a guy that's had a love affair with hunting? Right? They're kind of overly enthusiastic. Fishing. You know, uh, if you've got a guy that has got a boat, he's really into fishing. He has a love affair with fishing. He's got two tackle boxes. And you open that up and it's got like 16 different shells that fold out of it. There's these little bins. And there's 900 different lures in each tackle box. That he's just overly enthusiastic. He's overly attached. He's just really wrapped up into it. And that's the part of the love affair I want to talk about tonight. It's <clears throat> this definition that best describes what we're going to discuss. And we had one here. It's, it's, this definition said enthusiasm, love, passion, appreciation, devotion, mania, and zest. And it best, would be best described would be to say that J.J.'s love affair with roping knows no bounds. There's no place that he wouldn't go. You know, uh, there's no place, uh, if you've known people that scuba dive or ski, they, they, there's just no place they won't go. When, when they've conquered this, they want to move on to the next. Because they have this great enthusiasm, this love, this passion, this appreciation and devotion to this thing. So if I ask you, does that describe your relationship with God? Are you in the middle of a love affair with God? Because God is in the middle of a love affair with us. Are you at a place where your relationship with God is enthusiasm, love, passion, appreciation, devotion, mania? You know, a lot of times we think of mania, we think of WrestleMania, you know, but... Does your relationship with God, are you living in a love affair with God? Are you just so overly enthusiastic, so in love, so passionate about it? And if you're not, I want to ask you, why not? Why are you not at that point with a God that loves you so much? How can we get to a place? How many of y'all remember uh, 
when you, when you first accepted Christ, when you first come to the saving grace and how on fire you were and how enthusiastic you were, how passionate you were, how much in love with God, you just wanted more and more and more. You just wanted to know. You had this great zeal, this, this, this kind of devotion, this mania to, to know God. And how did we get to a point of that we got so complacent that we've lost this love affair? That it's, it, it's kind of a one-sided affair that God is continually pouring out and showing His love on us. How do we get to a point where we've lost our zeal, lost our mania? By the way, mania means an excessive enthusiasm or desire an obsession. How many here, how many of y'all like to hear my voice? Right now in your relationship with God could use the word obsessed to describe your relationship with God. If you brought your Bibles, we're going to be in Psalms 42. It's a short psalm. We're going to read the whole psalm. We're going to do it in bits and pieces and break it down. But how is it that we have this God that loved us so much and has such zeal and so forth? He sent His Son down here and His Son went through this terrible time to demonstrate this great love, this great passion, this great devotion to us, we come to that point and we meet Him head on and He comes into our lives and He changes our lives and we just get on fire with the Lord and then next thing you know, we've just kind of died out. You know, it, it, it's kind of uh, nothing but ambers smoldering, I guess would be a good way to put it. Psalms 42 says, As a deer longs for the streams of water, so I long for you, O God. I thirst for you, God, the living God. When I can go and stand, <clears throat> when can I go and stand before him? What enthusiasm. He says, I thirst like the water, like the deer desires the water, like the deer has to have it. That's one thing everybody has to have. Every living animal, every living plant, anything that's alive cannot survive without water. And the psalmist says, As the deer longs for the streams of water, so I long for you, O God. I'm just in this love affair. I just long for you, God. You're just calm. I mean, it's, it's what gives me life. It's what restores me. It's what refreshes me. I just long for you. I thirst for God, the living God. When can I go stand before Him? I just want to be in His presence. I just want to be around Him. I just, you ever, you know, uh, you know I've seen it in a lot of young relationships, mainly with younger people. I was like, oh, I just want to be around Him. I just, I just want to sit beside Him. I just want to talk to Him. Uh, I remember, you know, when we first start dating someone, we can get on the phone and we can have hour-long conversations. Now we can't listen to them for five minutes. How did we get there? How did we lose this devotion and this passion for God that loves us so much? And in this psalm, it goes on to tell us. The psalm, we truly knew how he longed for God. He knew all that God had done. His love affair knew no bounds. But this happened. Look at verse 3 and 4. Day and night, I have only tears for food, while my enemy continually taunt me, saying, Where is this God of yours? My heart is breaking as I remember how I used to be, how it used to be, and I walked in the crowds of the worshipers, leading a great procession to the house of God, singing for joy and giving thanks amid the sounds of the great celebration. The psalmist says here, We have an enemy. How do we lose this? We have an enemy. We have someone that is desperately seeking to break up this affair. We have an enemy out there who has many helpers that does not want this love affair to last. And, and the psalmist says here, the day and night that I only <clears throat> tears for food while my enemies continually taunt me and say, where is your God? And we get beat down and we get beat down. And how many of you have went through a valley, have went through a struggle, have went through a sickness, and maybe even have had someone that is your friend or an acquaintance or whatever to you, where's your God now? 
All this that you had. Where is your God now? Where is God for you now? What is He doing for you now? Look what's happening to you. Look what you're going through. And every time they beat on us, they get us to give in. They get us to surrender. They get us to fall back on our old nature. You know, when, when old slick gets us to mess up, it's just like it says in, in, in verse 4. The guilt kicks in. You know, my heart is breaking as I remember how it used to be. How many of you thought about, man, I just want that back. I know people have said that in their relationships. When, when I get into counseling with people in, re, in broken relationships, troubling relationships, so I just want it to be the way it used to be. I want to have that fire. I want to see that spark in their eye. I, I just want it to be the way it used to be. And, and that's what the psalmist is saying here. I want to be back with God. I remember how it used to be. I want to be back in that joy. I want to be back full of enthusiasm. I want to be back to the point where I'm just overwhelmed. But understand, there's that enemy that's constantly standing there that's trying to trip you up and get in your way. He knows your weaknesses. So guilt will kick in. Worthiness will kick in. And when that guilt kicks in, one of two things happen. should only be one. If you're a brother and sister in Christ, only one thing should happen when you get to that point. But there's always two. And usually the first thing that happens is we allow the guilt and the shame to push us away from God. We allow the guilt and the shame to come in and be a wedge between us and God. God starts to say, the devil slick starts to say to you, see, you have not changed. You are the same person. See? You haven't overcome that. You haven't overcome this. You take someone that's in an addiction and they did so good for six months, nine months, a year, and maybe as they used to say, fall off the wagon. I don't know, they leave that, use that term anymore? They fall off the wagon? They still use that term, Bobby? I, I haven't fell off. You haven't fell off so you don't know? I think it's... <coughs> But, y'all know, look, they fell off the wagon. I, I remember people that would see guys and ladies walk an aisle and, and just make a profession of faith and just be broken down and stuff. And then six months later, they would see them in a situation like they had seen them before. And automatically, they go right back to reverting to characterizing that person as their old self. See, nothing's changed. But if you've truly been in a love relationship, if I can honestly say that Terry's love for me has changed my life. Changed to the point where there's no way I could go back. I couldn't be that same person. It's had such an effect on me that it's an everlasting change. The love affair that we've had for the last well, 18 years has been something that's constantly grown. Has it always been beautiful? Absolutely not. Has there been troubles and pitfalls and heartaches? Absolutely. But I always knew that she loved me. I always knew by the way the things that she had done and the things that she was doing. Whether I was worthy of that love or not worthy of that love, I got to receive that love. And that's what we get from God. But Satan wants to tell you, you're not worthy. You haven't changed. It's the same old thing, the same old way. <clears throat> We are just so bad that you can't get past this. You're not going to be able to overcome this. You're too weak. You're not strong enough. And the truth of it is, he's absolutely correct. The things that Terry has helped me overcome in life, I could have not done by myself. The man that I've become today would not have happened if it wasn't for the love of my wife. And that's just the truth. More than anything, the man I am today, I could not be if it wasn't for the love of an awesome almighty God. The man that I am, the things that I do, do I still make mistakes? Yes. Do I still trip up? Yes. Do I still do stupid bonehead things that I did 10 years ago? Absolutely. But one thing I've refused to do, that I've made up my mind to do, is I will not allow, old slick, I will not allow the devil to come in and bust up 
this love affair? What happens in a marriage and when someone gets beat down, when someone's in a relationship and they feel unappreciated, unloved, un <clears throat> unwanted, then somebody comes whispering in that ear and starts to fill them full of worldly lies. You don't deserve that. You don't need that. You're better than that. You want to have. And the next thing you know, they have run a wedge in between this great love affair that God has started. And it's the same thing that Slick does in our life. When we start to get closer and closer to God, He wants to come in and bust up and break the thing. He will do it by tearing us down. Look at verse 5 and 6. Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? Will <clears throat> I will put my hope in God and I will praise Him again. My Savior and my God. Now I am deeply discouraged, but I will remember you even from the distant Mount Heron, the source of the Jordan, from the land of Mount Mazar. I'm going to go through this and I am in the middle of this. And all these things are happening to me. But I'm not going to let it separate me from God. I'm not going to let it disrupt this love affair. You know, God got entered into this love affair with me when, 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 when He put His love out there. He put His Son on a cross. He said, I'm all in. I'm going to give you the best that I got, all that I got, the only one that I got. I'm going to give you everything I got. I'm, I'm, all, I'm all in this. I'm holding nothing back. Was I ever deserving of it? Absolutely not. Was I ever worthy of it? Absolutely not. Will I ever be worthy of it? Absolutely not. Is there a point in my life where I'm going to be able to say, I have arrived, I have achieved it, I've achieved it. The only time that will happen is on that day of glory when God Almighty Himself looks at me and He doesn't see me. He sees His Son who's covering who I truly am. See, Satan wants to bust this love affair apart. You know, verse 7 says, I hear the taunt of the raging seas as the waves surge, surging tides sweep over me. I can hear it, and I'm going through it, and it rages over me. But in verse 8 says, but, always a but. I'm glad there's always a but with God, Bobby. I am so glad there's, a, there, there's not a, a, a period, there's always a but. This is what the psalmist says. But each day the Lord pours His unfailing love upon me. And though each night I sing His songs, and pray to God who gives me life. See, that's the second thing. When we hit these times, when we hit this, it should not drive us away from God. It should drive us to God. It should drive us to the one that does love us the most, who's given us the most, who's devoted the most to us. Why in the world would we allow it push us away from the one that loves us so much? I, I see guys and, and gals in relationships that are broken, and this individual is wedge their way down in there and they sit and they talk to me and there's tears flowing down their eyes and they tell me how much they love their spouse, how much they are committed to their spouse. But they've allowed this wedge to come in there and for some reason they think they can't get past this. And that's just where Slick wants you to get. Slick wants you to feel that you have went past it at that point that is too far where the love affair between God and you is over. And that is a lie, a lie, a lie, a lie. There's nothing that can end this love affair with God. And through the roughest times, through my biggest blunders, I will remember the psalmist says. Because each day God's mercies are renewed to me. Each day God shows that He is still devoted to me. Each day God shows that He is still enthusiastic about me. That He is committed to me. That He still loves me. I use this analogy a lot. We all have children and they do bonehead things and stuff. And, and some of the stuff, I mean, they do things where maybe they end up in prison. They end up in jail. They end up in financial ruin. They do stuff, uh, you know, do they got caught into drug addiction or alcoholism or gambling or whatever, and they've lost everything in their jobs and everything. But at no point in time have we ever stopped loving them. At no point in time has the love affair between me and my son, me and my children, my daughters, my sons, 
Now, have I ever, ever, ever stopped loving any one of them? Doesn't mean I was happy with them. Doesn't mean I approved of everything they did. But they were never turned away. They have never come to us and asked and said something. Said, you know what? I'd sure love to help you. But son, you know this last thing you've done, you, you, you just, you just, you just busted this deal up too bad. Nothing I can do. This love affair for you is over. Our love affair is shattered. It can never be repaired. It's never happened because it never could happen. Uh, the band uh, uh, sang this song uh, about a father's love. You know, a father's love is so strong for his children, so strong for his family. And just think, if your earthly father's love is that strong, how much more your heavenly father is? How much more he's in? How much more he cares? How much more he wants to do? You know, in, in the book of Lamentations, it tells us this. You want a promise from a God that loves you, that wants to have a love affair with you that's everlasting for all eternity? You want a promise that will never fail you, a promise that you can look upon and you can read, that you can take to the bank, that it's guaranteed to you? In Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 and 23, it says, The faithful love of our Lord never ends. God says, My love affair with you will never end. No matter what you do, if you turn your back on me, if you walk away from me, if you stop loving me, I will not stop loving you. And that brings to mind a, a George Strait song. When did you stop loving me? Remember that song that George Strait said? Was it this time? Or was it that time? Or was it this time? When did you stop loving me? Because I've never stopped loving you. And that's what it says in Lamentations. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercy never ceases. You know what it says there? It says mercy. You know what mercy is? Mercy is holding back from you every stinking thing that you deserve. Mercy is not calling you out, kicking you out, throwing you out, throwing you away. It says His mercies never cease. He never gives up. He's never wore out. He's never pushed too far. How awesome is that? Great is His faithfulness. We're talking about Almighty God and it says that His love and His mercy and devotion, His faithfulness to us. The devil wants to tell you that you're not special. God says you are. The devil wants to tell you you're not valuable. God says you are. The devil wants to tell you you ain't worth nothing. God says you're worth everything. He was willing to give everything. It's crazy how we get caught up in this. How God has shown to us over and over and over how He wants this love affair to keep going on. How committed He is to it. And yet how we can get broken and turn our back on it. Great is His faithfulness. Folks, this is a promise here that you can go to the bank on. His mercy begins afresh every morning. His mercies are renewed every morning. He's willing to start over, start fresh every morning. Not just today, not on Tuesdays, not on Thursdays. Not when He gets over it. Every morning, the Bible says. So we got in here, the faithful love of God never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is His faithfulness and His mercies become afresh, become new every morning. This is what we need to lean on. This is what we need to turn to. This is what we need to understand. Old Slick, you can't get on me. You're, you know what? You're right. I am a loser. I am bad. I am this. I am unworthy. But God loves me anyway. Matter of fact, God loves me so much He's got this affair with me. He has this devotion to me. He cares about me. Little old me. It, it, it's, it's amazing to me. We do not have to live in guilt or shame. The only way that we live in guilt and shame is if we choose to. Think about that. The only way, the only reason that you have to live in guilt and shame is because you choose to. Because the Bible just told you you don't have to. 
God's Word just says you don't have to. If you're willing to be driven and realize and repent and tell God and turn away and stop listening to old slick and walk away from that dude and walk back towards God, it says you don't have to live this way. You don't have to carry this. Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are burdened and heavy laden, for I will give you rest. Didn't mean it wasn't going to take some work, though, because he said, take upon you my yoke. You're going to have to get hooked up. A yoke is what took two oxen, put them side to side so they could pull and work together. Take upon you my yoke. We're going to work through this. We're going to work this out. We're going to do this together. But I'm going to be right there with you. Why? Because i got this great love affair with you. Why? Because I am so devoted to you. I am so passionate about you. I am so enthusiastic. I'm, I'm a maniac over you. But yet we're allowed to live some things that old Slick can say to us, to tear down from us and take away from us. Look at verses 9 through 11 as we finish this up. <clears throat> oh God, my rock, I cry. When <clears throat> Why have you forgotten me? Why am I, must I wander in grief, oppressed by my enemies? And God says, why? You don't have to. Why? The taunts break my bones. The scuffs, where is your God? Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? And he finishes like this. Why am I doing this when I can put my hope in God? Well, I will praise Him again, my Savior and my God. I will turn to Him again, my Savior Oh my God, I will put my hope back on the rock where it belongs. My path will be made straight. John the Baptist, I said, he, he said, I'm the one to tell him, I'm a voice crying in the wilderness, that the one that's coming is going to make the crooked straight. Every one of us is a crooked stick. I, I say this all the time. I heard this from a guy, that uh, a friend of mine that from, from years back, and he said that it was amazing what a straight lick God can hit with a crooked stick. Understand that God doesn't make any junk. God, only man can take what God has made and turn it into junk. And that's only if we allow Satan, old slick, to do that in us. It's not something that just happens because we can't. We can't change it on our own. We can't do it on our own. That's why the Bible says, confess your sins one to another. Some things can only be cured by fasting and prayer. God breaks it down. Tell your sins. How can someone help you and carry you and work with you if you're not willing to confess out what you've done? The Bible says that everything that's in the dark will be brought into the light on that day. That nothing is hidden from God. God knows already. And He's the important one. Why are we worried about what so-and-so thinks? What Bill thinks, what Bobby thinks, what James thinks. Why do I put more fear in them? Because God has the love affair with me. God is the one that's enthusiastic about me. God is the one that's devoted to me. God is the one that cares about me so much, He sent His Son to a cross. We can either choose to live with guilt and shame of our sinfulness, or we can live with enthusiasm, love, passion, appreciation, devotion, man, and zeal. Does your love affair with God know no bounds? Because His does. I'm going to close with this. Over in Romans chapter 8. One of the best chapters in the Bible. One of the best books in the Bible. In my humble opinion. Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. I don't know where you are in your life. I don't know where you are in your walk with God. I don't know if you strayed from God and God, you're beaten down. I don't know if, if you're in that devoted moment and you're just hooked up and that love affair is strong. Or maybe you're out there and you've never been hooked up. You've been having a love affair with the world your whole life. Maybe you've been lying to yourself. You thought going to church would do it. You thought reading the Bible would do it. You thought this was doing it. You see, the Bible says that we must tuck God's Word in our heart, not in our head. See, a lot of people have a lot of God in their head, but very little God in their heart. 
See, God in the heart has got to make the change. Why the heart? The heart's what drives everything else. And the heart is easily deceived. That's how Slick gets away with what he does. So we have to tuck it away in our heart. We have to change our heart. Paul said this in Romans. Chapter 8, verse 38. He said, I don't know a lot. All throughout his books, he said, I'm not one that achieved. I haven't arrived. I'm not the guy. But this is what he says. This is what he says he's convinced of. I am convinced. Convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life. Neither angels nor demons. Neither our fears of today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Folks, there's a promise you can bank on. You want to get caught up in an affair? You want to start a love affair? I pray that you would start one tonight. A true love affair tonight. Father, we do love you. And Father, those words that we read tonight are so comforting. As the psalmist told us that when we get beaten down and our enemies are piled up against us and stuff, that we can got a choice which way we can turn. We can either believe the lies or draw close to the love. We can be drawn away or we can run too. Father, we can choose to either strengthen this love affair or weaken it. Old Slick's really good at what he does. And we have this sinful nature inside of us that is, is so susceptible, so easily astray. So Father, it would be my prayer tonight that we reignite this fire for you that this love affair for us starts to grow stronger and stronger. That as brothers and sisters, if we have strayed, we come back. That we understand that we come back on our knees. We understand that we come back willing to, for the consequences of our actions, but knowing that we can never, ever stop your love. That we can never end this love affair for you. And Lord, if there's one out there tonight that has had this love affair with the world their whole life. And maybe they've been in a, in a church house and they've heard preachers or they've watched some preaching on TV, whatever, and, and they got some knowledge in their head. Lord, maybe it's the one that's never seen you, never had anything to do with you. Maybe they've been, old slick has got them to where they, when they hear the word church or Christian, they run. But maybe they're listening tonight, Lord. Maybe there's an opportunity tonight that they realize that they don't have to live that way. That there's a God that loves him so much that's willing to have an affair with him for eternity. That will never let them down. That will never break their heart. And that there's nothing they can do to ever stop it once it's turned to us. Father, all they got to do is pray. All they got to do is believe. Believe that Jesus was who you said he was. You in the flesh. Believe that he died on the cross and was buried and resurrected. Lord, that they come to an understanding of what they are without you, what they've done against you, and how much they need you. Lord, tonight I pray that they'd be willing to start that prayer. Which is a simple prayer saying, God, I realize what I am. And I realize what I've done against you. And I understand how much I need you. I believe in my heart, my whole heart, that Jesus was you in the flesh, that he walked this earth to be my God, that he went to a cross to pay a debt I couldn't pay, that he died and was buried in a tomb, and on the third day he arose. You raised him from the dead, not for himself, that he defeated death for me, that I too may never die. That I too may have this eternal love affair with you. Father, I call upon you now to take the reins of my life. Lord, I ask you, Come in. I surrender all that I am unto you, and I do it in Jesus' name. And all God's people say.
If you said that prayer, please fill out. Well, fill out a green sheet. If you're here, <laughs> if you're online, find someone, a Christian brother, someone that you know that's looked up with the Lord, that's in the middle of that love affair, and tell them. And let them help and guide you. We love you all. God bless you all. Adios. That love affair is so important. You're right. Um, we need a green sheet online, too, I guess. All right, let's really finish it up. Oh, let's all go down to the river. There's a man walking on the